Fab. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Elle. I am the Avon uh, part of the Avon team at HarperCollins, and I am delighted today to be chatting to Steph Mullen and Nicole Mabry, authors of The Family Tree, which is out today in the UK in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. So, to kick off, without giving too much away, um, it would be great if you could both tell us a little bit about The Family Tree. Sure. Um, so. The Family Tree out today um, is about Liz and she goes on a journey to find her biological family after doing a DNA kit that lets her know she's been adopted. So she goes on this mission. She's trying to find herself, trying to find who she's really, where she comes from and who she is. And in that process, the FBI flag that she's related to a serial killer. So Liz doesn't know if she's in danger as she seeks out these family members and it's kind of a coming of age journey, but also she doesn't know if she's in danger and trying to figure out who the family, who the serial killer lurking in her family tree is, so. And the fun part that we did was we alternated it with um, chapters from the victim's perspectives. Um, you know, I really, we really wanted to do that um, to add a little mystery and intrigue into the book as well. Yeah, and that's something that all the readers so far have absolutely loved that you're not just having one perspective you know the narrative moves between so many different characters perspectives mm -hmm. um obviously you guys are a writing duo it's not that common to have that so one of the first questions i wanted to ask was how you guys made that work where did you guys start and kind of how did you you know collaborate together on the family tree sure so um we were nervous going into it. We didn't know what we were doing, how it was gonna work, if we were gonna ruin our friendship because we disagreed on everything. Um, but we met in New York at a previous job, what was it like eight or so years ago now, eight or nine years ago. And we just kind of discovered we had a lot in common. And then as years went on, we both discovered we had this interest in writing. Um, and so Nicole had been lobbing ideas at me for years, being like, look, we have opposite strengths. We feel really confident in different areas. If, if we could be one writer, it would be so perfect. Like, why can't we just combine to be one person? Um, so she was con she's a plot machine. She was always like throwing all these ideas. I mean, I was, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm invested in that one. I don't know about that one. And then, you know, finally one day she texted me. She's like, something about 23 and me. And I was like, oh my God, I love it. So we got to do it so then over the next few hours we independently kind of came up with like the exact same plot it was just like lightning had struck so um we were already living in different states at this point because i had moved to north carolina so we had to navigate being long distance from the start um which was a really interesting challenge for us but i think that helped it did yeah like, not having to transition to working in different places mm -hmm. you know doing that from the get-go yeah we like we just came up with the figured out our process yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, I flew up to Nicole um, for her solo book launch. And while I was there, I stayed with her for three days. And we sat across from each other on her couch from literally like 9 a.m. to like 10 p.m. and just outlined the entire book. Um, we knew that we would have to know where each chapter started and ended in order for mm -hmm. it to be cohesive and not feel jumbled if we were both pulling from different areas of the plot to write things, we had to split it up. Um, so we just kind of came up with a process where we outline, we you know, pick whichever chapters speak to us the most, mm -hmm. divvy up the ones that are left that we maybe weren't as enthusiastic about for whatever reason. Um, Cause you always have some hard ones in there. Uh, mm -hmm. So then we just kind of divvy them up evenly and we would just write and then send to each other every chapter we wrote for inline notes and edits so that mm -hmm. we really blended our voices. We wanted to make sure it was cohesive as one voice. So every single chapter we both touched in some way, um, we would just edit it, send back notes. And then whoever was the initial writer of that chapter would kind of have final say on if they agreed or disagreed with those changes and edits. Um, so just, you know, really trusting each other and believing each other's strengths, you know, we, we've just really come to enjoy that and just knowing that the other person is doing what they think is best too, so. And I think what was really interesting is in the beginning, because I had a solo book, I'm part of a bunch of published authors groups. And so I went to those groups and I was like, are there any writing duos in here that can tell us how this works? And I did chat with a couple of them and their formats of their books really lent to co-writing, whereas ours didn't. <laughs> so I was like, okay, those aren't gonna work for us. So we really kind of just did it blind and mm -hmm. just you know, did trial and error, what works, what doesn't work. So, um, and then we built the process from there. I think the harder part about it is when we get like edits from our editor, because that's not something we can really like divvy up. You do this part, I do that yeah. part. Yeah, so <laughs> we take turns doing passes on it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I think we're still fumbling around <laughs> a in, little in bit. the process to, you know, work out the kinks, yeah. but for the most part, it's gone much smoother than we were yeah. anticipating. Yeah, and we like, we like it also because we feel like 
it since we're editing as we go it feels much further along than like a first draft if we had written it by ourselves so mm -hmm. we kind of have that like built-in editing and brainstorming yeah. process we always have someone to bounce ideas off of someone to kind of fill in the gaps if we're having writer's block. So yeah. yeah, so it's been a, yeah, it's been a really nice experience so far. That's amazing. And to come up with such a effective collaborative process as well for a first co-authored book is so impressive. And, you know, at Avon Books, we all said that when it came to us, it was already so well formed. And I guess, you know, you had each other to bounce off. You were editing as you went and, you know, it's a testament to both of your writing. Um, you've kind of touched on the fact that you weren't always in the same place and you had to kind of write long distance. And I was gonna kind of ask how the pandemic affected your writing, but actually it seems like maybe it didn't affect it as much as it could have. Yeah, we're already prepared. Yeah, we're already, <laughs> you're already in a long distance relationship at that point. So, yeah. um, so it was kind of fun. Like, yeah, it almost maybe even like benefited that we yeah. were stuck at home mm -hmm. because we didn't have outside distractions really yeah. to pull yeah. us out to the offices or events or whatever it may be. So we just really sat down and buckled down. I mean, we're both highly motivated people. Yeah. So we're constantly pushing each other and, you know, making aggressive due dates and for ourselves just on like an internal basis. And, yeah. um, you know, I'm a very like organized planner, whereas Nicole was a little bit more of a pantser when I met her, but I pulled her over <laughs> to the dark side of planning. So um, it's, yeah, we just realized we had to be super organized and yeah, you know, we Zoom and FaceTime and use live Google Docs. So we, we just have a constant line of communication, which yeah. the pandemic you know that's what everyone had to do anyway was go to video totally. chat so we were kind of already doing it at that point yeah. <laughs> amazing yeah. oh that's really good and then in terms of the publishing journey because a lot of people that come to our youtube channel are interested in publishing and kind of that route in so and you've got an amazing route in so i kind of wanted to chat to you guys about that and you can tell our viewers about your publishing journey so far I'll let you talk about Hit Mad. Yes. <laughs> um, so in the very beginning, we started um, submitting it to agents and we were getting a great response. Like we were getting requests left and right. And so we were really excited. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the pandemic hit and everything dried up and mm -hmm. we were so disheartened. We didn't know what to do. We All of a sudden the responses we were getting were people don't want dark materials right now. And this book is pretty dark in some areas. So, I, you know, we, we knew we couldn't change it to be less dark. Yeah. So yeah. we yeah. were about to put it on a shelf. Yes. And then, <laughs> yes. And then I reached out to Nicole and I said, hey, this Twitter contest is coming up, Pit Mad. You tweet out your pitch a couple of times a day why not just try it? Like if it doesn't hurt, no harm, no foul, we'll put it in the drawer. We'll wait till the pandemic eases up. Let's just last ditch effort. Let's, let's just put it out there. Um, and then our, of course, wonderful editor at Avon found our tweet and liked it. She read it over a weekend and just immediately reached out to us and started, you know, discussing, bringing us on board. So the fact that, you know, we were able to get our two book deal with you guys during a pandemic because yeah. of a tweet, it's just been such an incredible experience for us. And we just, you know, we feel so lucky and Oh my gosh, we feel so lucky because <laughs> like I said, we do belong to all these writers yeah. groups now mm -hmm. and we've been hearing a lot from them, mm -hmm. the same thing that they also wrote thrillers and they haven't been able to place them mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. Yeah. So we feel so lucky that we were able to find. We're like, people still guys. want the thrillers. People still want the dark <laughs> we, things. We, we do. Everyone. Yeah, we still love <laughs> the dark <laughs> stuff. Yes. Avon speciality. We are big yes. fans. It was, yeah, it was a match made in heaven. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you've kind of just touched on the fact that, you know, the family tree is very dark and it does have those dark moments. Um, I'd love to know when you were writing, did you ever kind of, it, did that affect you? Did you ever have to have a bit of a break thinking, oh God, the scene is, the scene is a lot or, you know, like kind of getting out of those characters' brains? Like, how did you guys cope with that? Well, right off the bat, I knew that I wanted to tackle the victims chapters um, mm -hmm. with a lot of input from Steph, and then she heavily edited them. And we wanted them, them to be a little bit shorter. But so mm -hmm. I was really heavily into those dark moments of the book. Um, and I think it was probably a good thing because mm -hmm. um, I'm just a dark person to begin with. And I, you know, I love <laughs> horror movies. I love, you know, I can watch thrillers and horror movies all day long. And it doesn't affect me that way. Yeah. I, ju I just get thrilled by it. So mm -hmm. I think that had I been a different person, I probably would have had to take breaks from it because, mm -hmm. you know, especially because, you know, these girls are confined and that can be very claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. Especially during a pandemic yes. when people are <laughs> confined, you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think for me, I, I had a great time with it, mm -hmm. but it could have gone the other way. Yeah. And I think what helped is 
what was really important for us was for the whole book not to just be this depressing pit. Like we wanted to make sure it was about Liz's personal journey as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having some characters that were some relief with a little bit of humor and a little bit of maybe romantic interest. Like we didn't want this to just be a serial killer book. We wanted it Mm -hmm. to have a little bit of like a personal touch and focus more on the victims rather than glorifying the serial killer. And yeah. so I think that kind of all helped balance it out as well. And, and like Nicole said, like that was one of the first parts we tackled. Mm-hmm. So then we just got to mainly focus on Liz's journey nice. then in the trunk as well. So I think it, I think it worked out well yeah. in that sense. And quite frankly, um, I wrote those chapters much darker than they actually Oh yeah. <laughs> kind of pull me I back. reeled her in a little bit, you guys. I did. She would be like, okay, this is a little too much to pull. Bring it back. Bring yeah. it back. Bring it back. Yeah. I don't know if I could have coped. <laughs> I know that's what we said. We didn't want, we wanted it to be creepy without being a turnoff. Um, yeah. Obviously a serial killer who's killing for 40 years is going to be a very dark, disturbed individual. Mm-hmm. Um, but we didn't want that to overshadow everything else in the book. So yeah. we just want to make sure it was realistic, but also, you know, in a way that people could cope as they were reading it. A serial killer book with art. Yes, that was yeah. a quote we got. Yes. And that really made us smile because that's exactly what we were going for. And we didn't even really realize it probably yeah. at the time, but that yeah. was such a nice, that was such a nice review here. Yeah. Totally. And as you said, like having those dual narratives, you've got Liz's story and Liz's journey. So it helps really break that up. So it isn't, you know, not too much darkness in one go. Mm -hmm. Um, Steph, you kind of mentioned some of the other characters there. Obviously, in loads of the reviews, everyone talks about Liz and how fab she is as a character. Everyone adores Liz. (laughs) Um, But are there any other characters in the book that you felt really drawn towards? Any (laughs) that you kind of would want to like expand more on in a you know, in another book or another life? Sure. Um, well, obviously, you know, her cousin Andy is a huge role in her life. Um, mm-hmm. They're best friends. They're similar in age. They are, but they're very opposite. You know, like everyone kind of has that friend that sometimes you're like, maybe you're a little like awkward in public because they're like a little bit embarrassing, but you love them so much and you just have a great time together and, you know, your, your opposites kind of attracted. Um, so she was a lot of fun to write. I think we had a really good time like inserting her kind of like humorous one-liners here and there. And, and I think at one point I even like texted Stephanie and mm-hmm. I was like during one of our like read throughs and I was just saying to her, I really love Liz and Andy. Yeah. If they really existed in the world, I would want to hang out. We want to be them. friends with yeah. them. Like, <laughs> so I think yeah. that was really fun for us. Yeah. Um, and then for me, I wrote um, or I put in a lot of stuff from my Mexican heritage mm-hmm. in Chris mm-hmm. and Rosie. Mm-hmm. And so I especially love Rosie. Yeah. Like, she's just one of my favorites. And she's she just reminds me of like my aunts, you know, very doting, very caring, mm-hmm. you know, always mm-hmm. making sure you have what you need. So it was really fun for me to inject some of that from my mm-hmm. own family yeah. into into Rosie. Yeah. And you know, without any spoilers, <laughs> we we insert a little bit of a love interest line for Liz. And mm-hmm. I think we both really love who that character turned out to be um he was kind of like a last minute addition Mm -hmm. um we didn't initially have any sort of romance at all but then we kind of like were hinting at it accidentally and our editor pointed it out and so we were like wow that (laughs) really would be great to expand upon and so then we really went in and we kind of developed that throughout the later half of the book um and we ended up loving his character their interactions it was just such a nice like relief from the personal turmoil that liz was going through so i think i really would like to explore that relationship more too I want to date Mickey (laughs) (laughs) they say that book boyfriends are the best boyfriends so it's true true. um oh that's really great um I also wanted to ask about the research side of things uh the family tree obviously we're looking at 23andMe the DNA ancestry side of things which is fascinating and really makes the family tree stand out from other kind of crime thrillers in this area how much research did you guys have to do on the DNA side? And yeah, just I'd love to know more about I'll that. You, I'll let you tackle that because Nicole is like, research is her favorite thing in the world. So, yeah. <laughs> so to, to begin with, that was one of the reasons why I was so aggressive in trying to bring her on to <laughs> our team is because we did have such opposite strengths. And one of my strengths is research. Mm-hmm. I can go down rabbit holes for hours. Yeah. And I will knock on every door until I have a definitive answer. Um, so we knew that this was going to be a difficult one, um, mm-hmm. not only with the FBI investigation, mm-hmm. you know, the only thing we know about that stuff is just from watching movies right. and stuff like that. And we know that a lot of that's some embellishment, you know, embellishment. Yeah. Yeah. just a little yeah. so <laughs> to be accurate to mm-hmm. what would actually happen. Mm-hmm. And, um, 
then the genealogy side was also an area that, and like we had written this whole part about the genealogy and then this um, show came out with CC Moore called The Genetic Detective. And I was watching the first episode and she lays it out so with a grid yeah. on the screen and it's so simple to understand and I immediately called Steph and I said we've got something wrong <laughs> and so yeah. we ended up contacting I, I knocked on so many doors on Facebook on genealogist um, forums mm -hmm. and asked if anybody would be willing to talk to us and give us the lowdown on, on genetics and genealogy and we had this great woman named Carriel and she loved the idea mm -hmm. and she and she just went into so much depth. She made us graphs using her own family yeah. tree to like explain to us the different percentage of connections and just so we could really understand like what would these relationships look like how would they connect what would the fbi see when they get the results from gen match like yeah. we just really wanted to understand the ins and outs and she was absolutely mm -hmm. invaluable she was really great. yeah and then um on the fbi side we actually um i think we wrote it first and mm -hmm. we had certain things going on in there that were kind of based on things that we've seen in other books or in other movies thinking that they mm -hmm. were completely accurate yeah. and then we found this I, I just emailed the fbi and i was like hi <laughs> can you talk to us yeah <laughs> is there anybody willing to like answer some of our questions and they have this great public relations um email that you can do for that so we emailed and we got a response back from jeffrey and he yeah. was like i would love to do this so we set up a call and we realized we had some things wrong yeah, there but too. he was great i mean he worked on a ton of really big cases that we had heard of and he was mm -hmm. so open to answering our questions and he talked to us for like what was like an hour and yeah. just wow. like really like answered every single question we had about their process about serial killers in general about mm -hmm. you know mass yeah. crimes about how they would interview people what they would call people in the precincts like yeah. just so many different things mm -hmm. that really helped shape that those conversations to feel more believable so yeah we're, we're so grateful for that yeah and i mean those were the really big things that we had to research mm -hmm. but like on a daily basis <laughs> so we much, had, yeah. you know just random things mm -hmm. like oh, you have this town here. Is it really there? So we would go down a rabbit hole of looking on maps and making mm -hmm. sure we had the distances correct. Or like what and... events happened during this yes. time period, during this season in this location? <laughs> like just, you know, there was, this was one of those books where we felt like, yes, it's fiction, but we we didn't want to embellish the facts because it yeah. it really, it's based off, you know, true crime and about things that are really happening. And we didn't want to lose that, you know, yeah. lose that feeling. So mm. I had so much fun on the research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like I, your enthusiasm is like radiating through the screen. Yeah. It's so nice. <laughs> um, yeah. And again, it so it comes through in the book, like that authenticity is so, so apparent in the family tree. Um, <laughs> Steph, you just mentioned true crime. And obviously I know you guys are massive true <laughs> crime fans, but um, our watchers maybe don't. So yeah, it would be great to know uh, kind of what your inspirations for the family tree were and kind of, you know, the kind of true crime that you guys are interested in. Sure. So we both had been following the Golden State Killer for a long time. Nicole grew up in California during kind of the golden age of serial killers. And, you know, I had just like in my 20s really started getting into true crime podcasts and you know, books and movies and um, really just taking it all in. And then when the Golden State Killer got caught using a familial match from a relative's DNA kit, it just was such a like groundbreaking thing to us. And I think and to I everyone. think we knew at that point, I mean, I think the world knew, mm -hmm. but we knew right then that that was going to completely change criminal investigations. Yeah, absolutely. And we also like just knew like this is something that is now happening more and more like ever since he was caught using it. It's been popping up constantly on Every cold day. cases. And we were sitting there and we're like, this is, this is it. Like, this is the next story that needs to be told. And like, if we're like, we want to tell it, like we want to get there and tell the story before everybody starts telling the story. So we knew someone was going to write yeah. this book and yeah. we wanted to beat everybody. Yeah. To and we them. wanted to do it in like our unique way with the mm -hmm. unique format and telling the story in this, this really interesting way. So we dropped the solo projects we were working on and just immediately started working on it like full steam ahead. Um, but yeah, true crime played such an inspiration, not only mm -hmm. the Golden State Killer, but all the podcasts we listen to and books we read. And um, yeah. it's just, you know, it's interesting that everyone has liked true crime for so long, but it hasn't really become okay to talk about until the last few years. I yeah. feel like once like My Favorite Murder came onto the scene and it became very cool to talk to your friends about murder and true crime, um, we realized we all had this similar interest. So, I mean, we've made so many friends in the community mm -hmm. of people who are interested in true crime and it's been, yeah, it's been such a huge influence on our, on our story. For yeah. Sure. And also we were inspired a lot by our own familial heritage mm -hmm. um, with our characters. Yeah. So I think we, we really wanted to inject those um, 
cultural references to mm-hmm. are different. And so our, our family's also inspired. Yeah, a lot because of that. Liz grows up in a predominantly Italian family, which is what I grew up in. Nicole is part Mexican, which influenced where Liz's biological family came from. So, you know, pulling on the food dishes, the language they use, the way they refer to each other affectionately, things like that, all we really wanted to kind of inject into And the also, story. I want to say, like, the roles between men and women mm-hmm. in the different cultures. Mm-hmm. That was really important. And the different time periods as well. Yeah, yeah. for sure. That's so interesting. And yeah, and really nice that you guys can inject that into your book as well and have that lovely, you know, personal touch there is really, really lovely. Um, I would love to know your favorite true crime podcast recommendations for our listeners. Everyone, these guys are on YouTube, so they're clearly going to be podcast kind of people. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, of course, I have to mention my favorite murder, as I already mentioned, Mm -hmm. because it's it was one of like, obviously, you know, like serial and undisclosed and all those were kind of like the first ones to break it big into the scene. But then I feel like my favorite murder was important to us because it brought us a writing group of people who like true crime. It brought, mm-hmm. it connected us with everyone on your team, yeah. it just uh, even across the ocean. So that's been really huge for us. And, you know, that's been really great. But um, spinning off of that, um, I, the murder squad with Paul Holes and Billy Jensen is a, one of my favorites. Um, anyone who listens to my favorite murder or follow the Golden State Killer case probably is familiar with those names. Paul Holes was now a retired cold case detective who was one of the ones who caught, was involved in catching the Golden State Killer. Billy Jensen is an incredible investigative journalist who works on cold cases as well. And they're very genuine down to earth, but the cool thing is that they crowdsource to help solve the crime. So they give homework each episode that like fans from around the world can pitch in for evidence and witnesses and things like that to kind of help you know, solve the cases as and a I'm team, sure you so. just, you feel like you're a part of the investigation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that, I really love that about that one. I think they're just brilliant. And so that's one of my favorites as well. Um, I mean, mine's my yeah. favorite. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, there's, I mean, there's so many other great ones out there um, yeah. as well. And yeah. for UK listeners, uh, Red Handed is a great one. Um, it's like very similar, my favorite murder, but of course it takes place in the UK, but they have a very similar kind of humor and honesty about them. That's really yeah. great. Um, and another one, that I would recommend is Counterclock. Um, that's a, it's US based, but it's really interesting because they did one season of the podcast. And then when they did the second season of the podcast of a totally different murder, the murders ended up being connected and that had never been unveiled. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it had never been unveiled before um, this journalist went in and started investigating these crimes from her hometown in North Carolina in like a seaside that's town. Crazy. So yeah. it just was, yeah, it was just so incredible that by her digging into these old crimes from her own hometown that she ended up connecting two murders that hadn't been connected before. So that's oh my God, it's giving yeah. me chills. That's so I weird. know, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, and Stephanie was kind of my introduction to podcasts on this mm-hmm. and what I find just amazing about these podcasts is almost all of them are kind of humorous yeah mm-hmm. so it's it, you're talking about murder and you're laughing and making jokes and I don't, but they're not not about the murder that's just, very yeah. important yeah. to clarify yeah, just their banter but and it makes I, it more accessible I mm-hmm. also just feel like that like you said that wasn't acceptable mm-hmm. prior to like maybe yeah or five years, years ago, ago yeah. yeah so that's I think it makes it more engaging for people mm-hmm. to have that banter between posts yeah because it's like you're talking to your friends and yeah. you're like talking to people that understand what you're interested in yeah. and yeah. you it's know not just a documentary about something it's, yeah. yeah it has more personality to it you're able to really like sink your teeth into hearing about so many different cases too because there's you know some podcasts that cover one case but then there's other ones that every episode is a different case so there's mm-hmm. just so many op- yeah. options out there and you can just learn so much about all the twisted people in this world that (laughs) unfortunately exist but you know it's give us a lot it'll give us a lot of book inspiration so it's okay well exactly (laughs) and the psychology is fascinating that's why so many people are interested in true crime it is really fascinating yeah like just trying to like understand how these people do these unimaginable things Mm. and what that means for their own person and like everyone they affect is it's heartbreaking and interesting and crazy all at the same time. So, mm. well, and I think what's most interesting is, yes, everybody is now interested in all of these cases, and mm. that the interest in that has gone so far up. Mm. But I feel like what is going to be most interesting moving forward is I feel like with all of these new investigative techniques and mm-hmm. DNA technology and all that, the noose is kind of closing in on these oh, killers. Yeah. So, mm. have gone away with it for decades, yeah. some of them, yeah. like, killer, like, have ruined so many lives and just flew under the radar. And now it's kind of, it's it's finally coming to the surface yeah. and getting solved in new ways which is just so amazing yeah mm-hmm. and I feel like that's going to result I mean I'm hoping that's going to result in less serial killers because <laughs> yeah. 
they won't right. be able to get away with it as easily as they used to. to. And I, like Steph said, I grew up in California during the decade of serial killers, mm-hmm. and they were just running rampant wild <laughs> in California at the time. Yeah. And it was scary. So for yeah. me personally, it feels good to, especially the Golden State Killer, who yeah. you grew up like hearing mm-hmm. about. So yeah. and the Night yeah. Stalker, those yeah. were the two that really oh. impacted. Youth, so. yeah it's almost like a form of closure isn't it those kind of it, the resolution it's really really good um I had one more question it's a bit of a fun one um if we if you were going to cast um your lead characters in um the family tree if it was made into a film and you can have any actor who would you choose um okay so Nicole's um, like I'm ready no I just want to preface that Nicole has made charts for every character we write with photos and just of them young of them old of descriptions like she really spends a lot of time getting to know our characters so that's why I immediately looked at her (laughs) I'm a very visual person and we both work in visual fields she's Mm -hmm. a graphic designer I work in uh, photography post-production so I think for both of us having that visual reference to constantly look back to is super helpful um in my head uh andy was always late in easter um (laughs) because i was watching a lot of that show single parents at the time (laughs) and so when i was watching her personality on there i was like this really to me feels like Mm -hmm. andy and so i always had her in my head the weird thing is is that in the beginning we i don't think we had um Liz being Mexican, we were just, Mm -hmm. you know, general. And so Steph had picked Gal Gadot Mm -hmm. for um, Liz's character. For like her visual Mm -hmm. appearance. Her appearance, yeah. But now the one that I would love, she's a little too old, but we're, um, I think she could. They can play young. They can Um, play (laughs) number. I know. But um, one of the shows that I work on is Queen of the South. And um, the lead character is Elise Braga. And she's just stunning to look like. And she looked to me is what I think of when I think of Liz. Mm -hmm. Um, She's got that heavy brow. She's Mm -hmm. got yeah, the, the brow is crucial. The brow is yeah. crucial. <laughs> so for me, that's who I would have. And then um, I had one for Chris as well. Um, I'm, his name is slipping my mind, but I have two. <laughs> it's either Andy Gar- Garcia or um, who's the guy that, oh, Joe Montaigne. <laughs> nice. Very nice. I can so see that. I can so yeah. see that. <laughs> and then the one that I think I would love for uh frank for chris's brother that would be i think um edward james almost for me um i'm surprised you didn't immediately have someone for mickey picked out (laughs) yeah we have to think about that that i don't don't know know. send us attractive men and we'll talk we'll get back (laughs) so i know amazing oh thank you both so much for chatting to me today um for everyone watching the family tree is out now in the uk in paperback ebook and audiobook um you can get your copy anywhere that sells books um and thank you both so much and happiest of publication days thank you so much